Hello and welcome to our next lecture in our continuing series on physiological psychology. Today we're going to talk about the somatosenses, uh, which are essentially the body senses, soma meaning body. And so we'll be talking about what is traditionally thought of as touch, but also includes things like pain, pressure, temperature, uh, and also what we call haptic perception. And we'll talk a little bit about proprioception uh, today, which we'll revisit uh, in a later lecture uh, when we talk about movement. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We'll first talk about what somatosensation is, the different kinds of somatosensation. We'll then talk about the different somatosensory receptors and what they're associated with. We'll talk about tickling and some of the reasons why you can't tickle yourself. We'll talk about somatosensation in the central nervous system, perceiving details versus perceiving objects. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about pain perception, relieving pain through analgesia, uh, different types of opioid analgesics, an important topic. Uh, certainly uh, in uh, uh, current times as there is a, a bit of an epidemic of opioid overdose and uh, abuse. We'll then talk about sensitization of pain and issues involved there, uh, some gender and sex differences in pain perception, and then finally we'll talk about itching uh, and its relationship to pain. So somatosensation refers to the sensation of the body and its movements. So this can include discriminative touch, that is your ability to tell the difference between a smooth and a rough surface, or even to tell the difference between you know, a set of keys in your pocket versus uh, your wallet versus your phone. Uh, it also includes things like deep pressure. So those of you who are fans of getting a deep tissue massage or uh, might also uh, engage in what's called self-myofacial release, which is the stretching technique using something like a foam roller. Uh, cold versus warmth, of course, this is an important uh, part of our perception. Uh, later on, we'll talk about temperature regulation, and so uh, cold and warmth will be an important part of that. Of course, pain is uh, a critical part of our survival. Pain perception is uh, critical to our survival. People who are born without the ability to perceive pain often don't survive very long because they don't know when something's wrong, they don't know if they've injured themselves, they don't know if their appendix is ruptured, they don't know uh, that there's anything wrong with them, uh, and so that's obviously a problem. Uh, itch, of course, is another uh, type of somatic sensation. Frankly, uh, I think I would rather be in pain than itching all the time. Itching drives me a little bit nuts, but it's also kind of related to the same uh, pathways, uh, neural pathways as pain. We'll talk about the relationship between pain and itch. Oftentimes, opioid analgesics will cause people to itch a great deal, um, so we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, tickling, of course, is a whole another kind of sensation which can be pleasant or not. Uh, and then finally, position and movement of the joint. So this is what we call both proprioception and haptic perception. And proprioception is how we know where our body is in 3D space, and that tends to be uh, more part of our movement system. That is, there are senses, there are um, our sensory receptors within uh, our muscles and tendons that tell us if they've been stretched or not. So we'll talk more about that when we get to talking about movement. Uh, and then haptic perception is a little bit about how we perceive position and movement of joints and also when we get um, what we call force feedback. Uh, so for example, when you turn your steering wheel, um, if you notice it's stiff, you would get a little bit of force feedback. Or for example, if you've ever driven a um, car with a manual transmission, um, you might notice it's hard to get a car into gear. That's the kind of haptic perception we're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are different types of somatosensory receptors. These include free nerve endings, um, which are pain receptors. Uh, Merkel nerve endings, which are slowly adapting types of uh, receptors. So they don't adapt very quickly. Or we'll talk about fast ad faster adapting um, receptors, uh, which will adapt out very quickly and stop responding. But Merkel nerve endings are slower to adapt, so you will notice uh, the presence of a stimulus uh, for much longer. Uh, these respond to pressure, position, and deep static touch. So if you, uh, for example, are someone who uses a foam roller, this is where you um, would get that sort of deep static touch into one part of your muscle and you'll feel that uh, in those Merkel nerve endings. And the Meissner's corpuscles, which are also known as the tactile corpuscles, are rapidly adapting. Um, that is, they will adapt to the presence of a stimulus very quickly. Uh, this is why you don't notice, for example, uh, your watch or your ring after a while, because you've adapted out to the, its presence. Same thing with your clothes. You don't notice them all the time. 
Uh, these have very low thresholds, that is, they're highly sensitive. So when we're talking about trying to do something like um, tell the texture of a material, uh, or if someone's reading Braille, uh, that would be done by the Meister's corpuscles. The Piscinian corpuscles are also fast, fast adapting um, receptors. They are sensitive to vibration, um, and their vibrational role may also be used to detect things like surface texture. So if you think about as you were moving your fingers across um, a rough surface, say a piece of wood, uh, you would feel it vibrate. And so the Piscinian corpuscles are part of that, uh, sensing that vibration. Similarly, this is how you notice that your phone's ringing if it's in your pocket or if uh, you have it set to vibrate. It's those Piscinian corpuscles that are responding to that. The Ruffini endings are slow adapting. Uh, they respond to sustained pressure. They're sensitive to skin stretch and contributes to our kinesthetic sense of and control of finger position of movements. So this is part of how uh, our proprioceptive system works and our haptic perception works. So again, these are slow adapting and they respond to sustained pressure and are sensitive to skin stretch and contributes to our kinesthetic sense of and control of our finger position and movement. Uh, so for example, someone who plays the piano um, will know where their fingers are on the piano because of uh, responses from the Ruffini endings. So if we take a look at these, um, you can see here in this figure on the right, <coughs> pain receptors are these free nerve endings. Um, the Meissner corpuscles here are right below uh, the dermis, or the epidermis, I should say. Uh, the Merkel discs similarly are shallow, whereas the Ruffini endings are a little bit deeper, as are the Piscinian corpuscles. So these are located sort of throughout the uh, dermis, and then here, of course, is the epidermis. So if we take a closer look at what these look like up close, here we have the Merkel. Um, sometimes these are called the Merkel discs. Uh, they respond continuously, so they're slowly adapting, um, and they perceive things like fine details. Uh, the Meissner corpuscles respond to change and are rapidly adapting, um, and they respond to things like hand grip and control of tools. Ruffini endings are slow adapting, they respond to stretch. And the Piscinian corpuscles respond to change, they're rapidly adapting, and respond to things like texture by moving our fingers. So another quick summation of uh, the different kinds of nerve endings. We have free nerve endings. They're near the base of hairs and elsewhere, elsewhere in the skin. They respond to pain, warmth, and cold. They have hair follicle receptors. Of course, these are hair-covered skin. This responds to movement of hairs. Um, this is, for example, when you get a chill and your hair stands on end, we'll talk more about why that does that with temperature regulation. Essentially, part of our leftover uh, hereditary mechanisms for uh, dealing with cold is to fluff out our um, fur to try to make it uh, warm, uh, to keep us warmer. And that's one of the ways in which you get that sort of chill response is from those hair follicle receptors. Uh, the Meister's corpuscles. Uh, respond to sudden displacement of skin, low frequency vibration, the Piscinian corpuscles, sudden displacement of skin, and high frequency vibration, Merkel's discs, light touch, Ruffini endings, stretch of kin, skin. Uh, and then we won't really talk about the Krauss end bulbs because uh, we think it might be part of the senses involved in things like genitals, but uh, this is, there isn't enough data for us to talk uh, about in a very uh, certain way. <coughs> tickling is uh, a sensation that's poorly understood, um, but we do know you cannot tickle yourselves because uh, our brain compares the resulting stimulation to an expected stimulation. And so um, if you have sort of braced yourself against somebody tickling you, you'll be a little bit less, perhaps less ticklish. Um, but you certainly know exactly what senses to expect when you're trying to sort of tickle yourself. That's the reason why you can't really do that, uh, because uh, when somebody else is sort of in charge of tickling you, you don't know exactly where they're going to touch or how it's going to go, whereas when you're trying to do it, you know exactly how that's going to go. Uh, and so this certainly is an example of sort of bottom-up versus top-down processing in the som somatic senses in that if you understand and expect a stimulus, it's not going, you're not going to get that tickle response. It's sort of like a startle response. You can't really startle yourself um, because you expect to startle yourself if that makes any sense. <coughs> so somatic sensation in the central nervous system, this is where we start to get into more uh, 
uh, in-depth understanding of how somatic sensation works. So information from touch receptors in the head uh, enters the central nervous system through the cranial nerves. So this is um, your scalp, face, um, mouth, etc. Information from receptors below your head enters the spinal cord and travels through, through the 31 spinal nerves uh, to the brain. So there are two different pathways from the skin to the uh, cerebral cortex. Um, these include the medial lemniscal pathway. These are large fibers that carry signals related to proprioception and perceiving touch. And the spinal thalamic pathway, these are smaller fibers that transmit temperature and pain. So the spinal thalamic pathway is going to include um, if you touch something hot or if you touch something sharp or if you've gotten stabbed or shot, any of those sorts of things. That's the spinal thalamic pathway. The medial lemniscal pathway is going to be things like if you caught a ball and you notice that you caught it and you feel it in your hand, or if you're reaching your pocket and trying to find your keys, that's going to be the medial lemniscal pathway. So these have two different properties because they have two different uh, function. So the medial lemniscal pathway is going to interact much more directly with the motor cortex. And so we'll talk more about motor cortex when we get to motor processing. Whereas the spinal thalamic pathway uh, transmit temperature and pain. Now, one of the other things we will talk about is the um, reflex arc. And what happens in a reflex arc is when you have uh, sudden pain, like you know, we've jabbed you with a pin, <coughs> or you've stuck your hand on something hot, uh, the spinal thalamic pathway will um, transmit that pain, of course, that perception all the way up to the brain. But these are also the fibers that will arc across an inner neuron to the motor neuron and cause you to jerk your hand away. So the brain's not involved in that reflex arc, but it is this spinal thalamic, uh, these same smaller fibers, uh, that transmit that information to the spinal cord and then across the inner neuron to the motor neuron uh, to cause that reflex arc. So again, that's going to be in those uh, small fibers that transmit temperature and pain. So there are various aspects of body sensations that remain separate all the way to the cortex. So there are various areas of the somatosensory thalamus that send impulses to different areas of the somatosensory cortex, which is of course located in the parietal lobe. And of course, there are different sub-areas of the somatosensory cortex that respond to different areas of the body. And this is, of course, what makes up what we call the homunculus, something you should have seen in introductory psychology. We do know that damage to the somatosensory cortex can result in the impairment of body perceptions, and it uh, oftentimes can result in uh, what we call alien limb syndrome, uh, where if you have had damage to the somatosensory cortex, you believe uh, one of your limbs has been replaced or belongs to somebody else. Um, that's why it's called an alien limb syndrome. So <coughs> to get to how we perceive different kinds of uh, somatosensory information, the first we'll talk about is what we call tactile acuity. This has to do with perceiving details. Um, we measure tactile acuity in a couple of different ways. One of them is through what's called the two-point threshold. Uh, and this is where we use what's called an anesthesiometer, which you can see here on the left. And that anesthesiometer um, can be, you know, moved apart closer together. Those two points can move closer together or further apart. And the uh, person who's being tested, all they have to do is respond to is to whether or not they feel one point or two points. That's why it's called the two-point threshold. Um, so here on the fingertips, you can actually perceive these as two separate points when they're very, very close together. We have a very low two-point threshold. Uh, in uh, our fingertips, but if you move to somewhere like your forearm, <coughs> it's actually quite far apart. In fact, you get you know, pretty close to an inch apart uh, on um, before you can actually perceive uh, the two points of the uh, anesthesiometer as actually being two points. Before that, you perceive it as actually one point. Of course, it's really important. You have to actually not see what's, what's touching you to know whether or not it's two points. Uh, grading uh, acuity is measured by whether or not you can determine if this is vertical or horizontal, so which direction it's facing, and then we just determine that by how far apart those grades are. Uh, so the way in which we um, end up with different kinds of two-point thresholds and different grading acuity has to do with our receptor mechanisms. And so 
the receptor mechanisms are related to the density of the Merkel receptors, which is greatest in the fingertips. Um, and so if you look at um, the uh, Merkel disc density in the fingertip versus the palm, uh, the density is the greatest here in the fingertips. Then when we get to the base of the finger, um, they get uh, further apart. Uh, and then when we get out to the palm, they're fur further apart as well. And this is, of course, related to tactile acuity. So this tells us how well you can actually determine um, something like a two-point threshold. Here we're down to uh, just right at a millimeter. And then you get up to the base of the finger, it goes um, up about five times to about five millimeters. And then when you get up to the palm, it's uh, almost nine millimeters apart that before you can determine that it's two points you're touching. Uh, the other mechanism that's associated with um, perceiving details and things like the two-point threshold has to do with cortical magnification. So areas that have a great deal of cortex associated with them have uh, much more sensitivity. So your fingers, your lips, uh, your face in general, have much more cortex associated with them compared to the sort of square footage uh, that they cover. So while your fingertips are very small, they have a great deal of, of brain associated with them. Whereas your thighs, your back, your belly um, have a lot of real estate, that is a lot of skin involved, but very, very little um, cortex involved. So if you look at um, the two-point threshold, it's less than five millimeters for uh, all of our fingertips in general. When you get out to the calf, it's 45 millimeters, uh, which is pretty large. It's four and a half centimeters. It's, you know, we're talking several, a couple of inches, two to three inches um, here at the calf that you, that you just have very, very low sensitivity. This is the reason why a, f a paper cut on your fingertips hurts far more than a, you know, a gash in your calf. Um, probably some of you are like me that you have <laughs> Uh, we'll be out in the summer walking around in shorts. You'll do something, end up with a pretty significant cut in your calf and have no idea until you look down and discover that you have been bleeding for some amount of time. That's because you just don't have very much sensitivity in those parts of your body. So another way in which we use our somatic senses uh, from a perception standpoint is in perceiving objects. Haptic perception is the perception of three-dimensional objects by touch. Again, this is how you find your phone in your pocket. It's how you find your wallet in your pocket. That's how you can dig out quarters instead of nickels and dimes. This is uh, all sorts of things like that. So we use three different systems for this process. Of course, our sensory system. Uh, we also, of course, use our motor system. Uh, one of the ways in which we eat get haptic perception is when we're trying to move something and it you know, pushes back, for example. Uh, this is how you know um, that a door is locked because you've got to turn the knob and you can't turn it. Um, and so uh, I'm sure you, <laughs> some of you have had this experience um, where you have been waiting outside a bathroom where there's no one in it because the door was the knob was simply hard to turn and you assumed it was locked. Um, that's because you got feedback when you went to turn that lock and so that involves both your motor system and your sensory systems. And then, of course, our cognitive systems. So this is about what we expect. So if you know a door is hard to turn, then you, you're going to put more force behind it. So if it's one you've had experience with um, versus others that you haven't had much experience with, you can sometimes assume they're locked when they're not. <coughs> um, it's a similar thing with a key. If you know a key is hard to turn, you'll probably put some more force behind it, which you might not do uh, in a different lock. And part of this, of course, we don't want to break things. Um, but all of this is what we call haptic perception, and it uses these three different systems for us to get at that kind of process.